Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining this special discussion, Diverse Voices Growing Up Both Black and Jewish, which is being presented by the Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance. I'm Tiffany Harris. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Moisha House, and I'm honored to be moderating this event today. So we all know that two communities are stronger when standing together. We're living in a time when it's never been more crucial to have mechanisms for coming together to combat historical Black oppression, structural racism, and anti-Semitism. To further that conversation, I'm going to moderate a discussion with three remarkable individuals. You're all in for a real treat, each of whom has an incredible story to tell and insight to share with our audience today. So first we have David Blue. David is originally from Los Angeles. He attended USC, which uh, fun fact was founded by his great grand uncle, Isaiah Hellman. Um, David was the star player for USC basketball, and he's a former professional basketball player who spent 10 seasons playing in the EuroLeague. Um, he's considered, another fun fact, he's considered to be one of the top three point shooters in its history. He spent his professional career playing for Maccabi Tel Aviv, yay, and <laughs> led them to the EuroLeague championships in 2004. So welcome, David. Next, we have Autumn. We have Autumn Rowe. She's a singer, songwriter, producer, DJ and a million other things that uh, I didn't have room to list on this, but she is phenomenal. She's from New York. Uh, she grew up in the South Bronx, uh, where she applied her musical talents to a range of roles from band leader to session singer, again, so many things. And today she's a sought after songwriter and she's worked with some of the world's biggest artists, including Dua Lipa, Ava Max, Avicii, Zed, Afrojack, Nick Jonas, Pink, my personal favorite, John Baptiste, and so many others. Um, she's currently signed to Stellar Sony ATV as a writer and Ultra Records as an artist. Welcome, Autumn. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And last but certainly not least, we have Born Rich. Rich was born in inner city Chicago, and he later moved to Los Angeles, where he grew up in the LA graffiti, hip hop, and skateboarding scene. He's now a very well-known and amazingly talented street artist and designer who incorporates those experiences into his pieces. Rich has also devoted his time to traveling the world and teaching kids and at-risk youth how to become artists and helping them reimagine a better life for themselves, a lot of times through art. To our speakers, we're so thankful that you've chosen to join this coalition and use your platforms to impact social change in our communities. And so for the audience, just to walk you through the first phase of this discussion, we'll explore the question, who are we through the sharing of our panelists' incredible personal stories. Second phase will help the audience understand where are we through the exploration of personal and shared racial history in our communities. Third, we'll discuss the vision for our community and the coalition in response to the question, where do we wanna be? And then we'll discuss what will we do as individuals and with others to help build on the work of this coalition. So where are we? I'll start by saying as a black Jewish woman, my identity naturally straddles multiple distinct communities. One of the prices of this intersectionality is uh, sometimes being subjugated or subjected to short-sighted interpretations of my identity, which I know is not unfamiliar to the people on this panel. <laughs> So I want to give each of you a chance to answer, how do you identify and what was it like growing up both Black and Jewish? Um, side note to our audience, it's generally not okay to ask the what are you question, but we're in a safe space and we're exploring racial identity, so we're going to go for it here. But um, I'll start with you, David. Uh, how, how do you identify and can you briefly touch on the experience growing up with those uh, dual identities? Yeah, uh, well, you know, now as I'm older, I realize I identify as a human being. But when I was young, I was raised to be, a, a, I was born to a, a black man and a Jewish mom, a white Jewish mom. So I guess I was a half Jewish, a half black, half white um, boy growing up. Uh, I, I didn't really know which one I was when I was a, a little kid. Um, I knew that um, both sides, well, at least the Jewish side was a little bit more welcoming to me than the black side, let's say. But I didn't necessarily feel comfortable in either of those to environments um, because there was never any like mixed people. There was never any black kids in the Jewish groups or white groups and there was never any white kids in the black groups. So I didn't really know where I fell in. So when it came to just in the classroom and just um, regular kids on the playground, it was challenging for me. So basketball was where I defined myself. I defined myself as a basketball player because there is no color in basketball. And so if you can ball then it doesn't matter what color you are, people will want to hang out with you and be friends with you. And so that's really how I identified was as a, as a, as a mixed kid who plays basketball and, you know, and that caused a lot of confusion for me, but uh, that confusion eventually turned into motivation 
and uh, that kind of pushed me along um, through my career. Turned into motivation and that drive and grit to hopefully get you where you are today, but definitely yeah. resonates the sense of, am I half half or am I whole? And I, I want to go to Autumn next. Does does any of that resonate with you? And on the question of identity and sort of that experience, uh, similar to David's, did you have a sense growing up at some point that you're like, hey, I'm I'm a little different than the folks in my community, and sort of uh, when that realization came about. First of all, I always identify as a New Yorker <laughs> more than <laughs> that's just a New York thing. Um, but I grew up in the South Bronx in the '80s, um, in like the crack epidemic. Um, there were no Jewish people besides my mom, so um, I pretty much was mistaken for a Dominican or Puerto Rican all the time. And people would just come up to me speaking Spanish, and I would just look confused or play along. Um, so you know, there was this weird place where uh, some of the some of the black girls would actually bully me, and you know, it was a weird thing. I just quite didn't fit in anywhere. So some of the black girls would bully me, and then I'd try to like I looked more similar to the Latin girls because we had like similar hair and complexions. Um, but I wasn't quite there yet. And then there were no Jewish people. So I just kind of like fit wherever, you know, um, it was, it was just a weird, a weird thing for me. Um, but as I, as I grew older, I was treated as a black woman. You know, I was, I can't ever say like, I was ever treated like a Jewish woman. So people growing up in New York and just in the inner city, you feel when you're black and you feel it as you grow up and you feel it in different situations. and the way opportunities are presented to you, the way people talk to you. So um, I quickly, as I started maturing, acted how I was treated as a black woman, basically. It's really interesting. I, I will say I identify with the New York piece walking down the street. You get uh, an, any number of countries shouted at you and it's always interesting to hear what people come up with. And Rich, you, you were born in Chicago and then you moved to LA at what age again? Uh, I was around three. Uh, we came out here early 82. 82, so, okay. Yeah, so early, um, excuse me, early in my development, my father always told us that we're Israelites, you know, we're trying to get back to Jerusalem. Um, so yeah, it was always ingrained in me what my culture was, but we weren't super religious. Uh, I had a grandma that went to a Christian church, so it was kind of like a back and forth thing. Um, as a kid, I had kind of like straight and curly hair, so I kind of didn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, he's black, but he's like, sometimes kids would call me Habib, not knowing if that was something that was racist, but, you know, I would just get uh, kind of like mixed reviews, but I definitely, like, uh, like David, I was a basketball player also, so uh, you basically earn your stripes on the court, so if you're good, doesn't matter what color you are, what race you are, like you said, if you can ball, you can ball, and usually those people get picked first. So yeah, I want you on my team. So <laughs> that's kind of how, that's kind of how um, uh, most of my life was until uh, older in my, in my adult career. And then what was that, what was the sort of change when you were, when you were older and how do you identify today? Uh, I identify as a black Jewish man, but um, initially when people see you, they just see you as a black male, you know? Um, but when you look at me, you wouldn't know I have 11 ethnicities in me, you know? So I go all the way back. My mother's North African, so so it's a it's a it's a wave that I ride. But primarily, when you see me, you see a black man. So that's what I identify as. And it's an interesting experience where you know when you're a kid and you're sort of sorting out who you are and kind of trying to understand all of the complexity around this, finding your source of strength, whether it's on the basketball court or in art, in music, whatever it is. Um, I know for a lot of people, some of the ways they connect to both of those sides are through family traditions, whether it's like food, language, music, whatever that is. So I, I'm curious to hear from you first, Rich, are there, um, like, what are some of favorite traditions, either family or that you've developed now that kind of incorporate those either 11 identities or <laughs> the two that we spoke of? Um, well, primarily it was just uh, just my family just coming together and having you know big family dinners and just all the cousins running around and having fun and just uh, just bringing our experiences together in one household and talking about uh, school and what we experienced on this side of town versus this side of town. But yeah, it's always just coming together and having big family meals at grandmother's house. Uh, 
softer. It's uh, it's not as as much as I would like it to be because you know everyone grows older and families kind of grow apart. But yeah, uh, usually the holidays um, we celebrate everything from you know Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas. So the whole holiday season is just filled with just food, 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 and family. So I kind of miss that because you know we're all kind of growing older and growing apart. But that was my now favorite. you can start them at your house, right? Yeah, yeah. With well, now I have a daughter, so. Yeah, next, we can start it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And Mazel Tov, by the way, on your your new baby girl. And what about you, Autumn? It's such an interesting experience growing up. I mean, when we think of New York, we think of like such a large Jewish population, but having a you know Jewish mom, but not being you know <laughs> surrounded by a Jewish community in that sense. Did you have traditions growing up, or did you develop some now that you know help connect you to those multiple identities? Well, my mom's watching, by the way. Um, so, Hi, mom. <laughs> um, um, the relationship with our family is was quite strained. Um, you know, basically, when my mom had me, her family were not very accepting of black people. So, um, unfortunately, I didn't grow up with a lot of traditions and things that kids should have had. So it was just my mom and I, you know, growing up in the worst of neighborhoods like people thought my mom was a police officer because they were like why is this white woman here it just didn't make any sense so you know sometimes we would do my mom tried to bring me up as the best she could so like we we did Kwanzaa at times we did Hanukkah you know we did a little bit of everything we didn't do Christmas though I have to say um that was the one thing we never had a tree or anything like that but we would have a menorah once in a while um we kind of just like made our own way, just the two of us, you know, and she did the best she could raising a daughter of being a single mom. But I didn't grow up with like a ton of traditions and stuff. But, you know, if I ever have kids, I definitely um, plan on doing so. Yeah, I, uh, it resonates. So my, my mom's also, uh, I mean, in today's day and age, I would say she's a white Jewish woman. When she was growing up, she was not considered white in New York City. And we were in our own tiny community because it was not so accepted to have a multiracial family, even in the late eighties. And thank goodness that's changing. I will say, yeah, tough times growing up, but one of the sources of support I found is through uh, art, through sports. Um, and I'm curious, I'll start with you, David, where, you know, when, when you're straddling these like very distinct worlds, sometimes growing up, it sounds like you found your support through basketball court anything else or any kind of coping strategies you developed growing up that sort of helped you find yourself um you know nothing that was productive it was usually hanging out with a rough crowd and you know ditching school and you know if you if you smoked a joint with your buddies then you know you were cool um so it was really it wasn't in productive ways it wasn't in art it wasn't in singing it was either in basketball or it was hanging out with my buddies and because I was an athlete I'm hanging out with other tough guys. So doing things that are not productive for teenage boys was my coping mechanism, I guess, was the way that I could connect with other boys because all boys get into mischief. And so I suppose that would have been, other than basketball, my coping mechanism, which would have been sort of listening to music with my buddies and just doing things that teenage boys do together. Um, but luckily you're six, six, seven or six, eight, six, seven. <laughs> yeah. Seven, six, seven. There's no way you're going to stay in that crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but you know what I did? Uh, you know, I hung out with other athletes. I mean, I hung out with football players, you know, other basketball players. And, and that was, you know, all big guys. So all big guys that were running, running around campus, you know, doing what we wanted to do. And so that was kind of like just having this, um, this gladiatorial armor on me was what kept me, you know, insulated from being made fun of or, you know, on the court, you can't feel sorry for yourself, you know? And so that sort of bleeds into your real life. And so I guess just the toughness that you have to have on the court and to excel in sports is the same toughness you have to have in real life when somebody calls you a name or, you know, doesn't allow you to do something. You got to you got to figure out a way to, to cope with it on the court. You got to figure out a way to cope with your bad games and bad stretches. And that's just kind of how I live my life, I guess. For it. And I do, I, before I forget to, to add folks, uh, audience members, feel free to put questions in the chat. We'll have about 
10 minutes at the end for Q and A, so keep the questions coming. Um, so Rich, somewhat similar question, but I'm curious to know in, you know, in your life today, have you kind of developed any coalitions of support uh, with others who are like you or not like you to, um, yeah, whether in the Jewish space and the art space to kind of dissect some of these issues and talk about identity? Yeah, um, we have a we have a couple group. I have a couple groups. I have one that's on um, Instagram and one that's on WhatsApp. Uh, a group of uh, people of color, Jews of color, and uh, we just talk about our issues and we go back and forth and empower each other. And um, it's really good. It's it's an alliance I wish I had when I was younger. <laughs> you know, just to talk to someone and be like, "Hey, how's it going over here on this side of the world?" But uh, yeah, I do have uh, alliances. Um, a couple of rabbis, back rabbis in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, one guy uh, named Lachaim OG, he's a rapper. Uh, me and him go back and forth. He's a really cool guy. So yeah, we do have alliances, but um, we always need more. We always need more allies uh, and people to talk to and, and just uh, share um, similar stories. Absolutely, shout out to Lachaim is his name. <laughs> yeah, Lachaim OG, <laughs> my guy. We'll check him out. And Adam, I want to want to ask you, in your opinion, what's the importance of having an alliance like this, especially at this point in time where we're at socially, politically, structurally? I think it's really important. Um, for one, people are listening for the first time, I feel like in a long time, you know, whether it's because people are stuck home with COVID or just the political climate. Um, it's just a good time to have the right message. So a lot of people are paying attention, you know, and I think that's why George Floyd, you know, that just caught on the way it did. It wasn't the first time something like that was happened, but it was the first time the world was standing still when it happened. And the world is still kind of at a pause. So I just think that this is probably one of the best times in history to ever do something like this and the most necessary. And um, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Also, this is the most I've ever been with other black Jews in my life. You guys, <laughs> you got to get on Rich's WhatsApp group. I mean, I'm not, I'm not on it, but wait, no, fight, we're but all, that's, all that's welcome. I'll send here. everyone an invite. I promise. <laughs> Autumn, we got you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, you know, yes, this is definitely the moment and it was so incur. I mean, for such a tragic summer and again, not the first time, as you said, but really start, I don't think this panel would have existed even a few years ago and started seeing like every mainstream Jewish organization shouting Black Lives Matter from the rooftop, which is like, finally, yes, and so exciting. But um, I wanna touch on on Israel a little bit. I, I know the folks on this call, some have spent a significant amount of time there, visited. And I remember that was such a pivotal moment for me in my life. You know, my, my white mom always told me growing up, she's like, you're Jewish, there are Jews that look like you, I promise. I was like, you're lying. It's just, I was like, oh, you're perfect. I'm like, thank you. But, you know, like, I, I couldn't believe it. And then when you land and you see Ethiopian Jews for the first time or Yemeni Jews, just every shape, size, color found in nature of Jewish identity that exists and how affirming that was and that, that sort of sense of home that I felt. And so, David, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, like, what are, what was the experience being, like, tall, like, Black American in Israel, I always found it very welcoming and um, a great sense of home. But I'm curious to hear from others if that experience was different or if you found it, found that you found well, it. Yeah, well, my first time was uh, when I was 16 years old. I went to play for the Maccabee Games. And so I went there in 1997. And when I landed um, and I got off the plane, which was at the old Ben Gurion, I really felt an immediate connection. Like the people there were so a welcoming for American Jews to come to Israel. And then that was fantastic. Um, later on in my career, when I, when I eventually went to play there for my, for my seven years to play for Maccabi, it was really like a home there. Um, I'm so grateful that I had a great career and I'm, I'm you know, a huge celebrity in, in Israel. And so for me, being in Israel was like, it was really being like um, home. And, and one thing I always talk about with people is, is that we really only have a few, a few homes. One of them is in our mom's tummy. Uh, well, the first one is in our own skin. And then the next one is in our mom's tummy. Then the next one is wherever our mom is when we come out. And then after that, you're on your own. So my mom died when I was 14. And I never felt at home. I never felt loved. I never felt like happy. And then when I moved to Israel, it was like 
all these people love me. And I felt, I felt like I was, I felt like I was loved by these people. And that made me feel like a sense of home. And so Tel Aviv became a real sense of home for me and still is. And I, I really love living in Israel. I lived there for so long. I played for the national team. Uh, I made Aliyah, I became a citizen. And so for me, Israel is really a home. It's a really special place for me. And uh, I'm so grateful that to have had that experience. That's wonderful. It doesn't hurt that, you know, beach, food, all of that. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I got to so tell fun. you, it's the most, it's the most kid friendly um, country I've ever been to. Uh, is, is Israeli, they want to grow the population. And so they're very welcoming for children and families to come in. The beaches are fantastic. You know, the food, everything's in English. So, it, you know, I, I've played all over the world and, and, and a lot of other players who have will also echo that playing in Israel is probably the best place to play for an American of any color because Israel is such a close friend to America. Um, in, in, while I was living they in Israel, I'm basketball. trying to, they love and basketball. they love basketball, you know, and, and they love speaking English. You know, I would try to, I would try to practice Hebrew. I'd ask a question in Hebrew and they'd answer me in English because they <laughs> want to practice their English. So yeah. it was such an American friendly place to live. Yeah. I will say I don't have kids yet, but I got a pandemic puppy and it is also a super dog friendly place. Yeah. Well, yes. puppy, you get so much love bringing your dog to a restaurant. I cannot do that. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and what about you, Rich? You spent, I've seen some of your work in Israel, incredible, but you also spent a pretty significant amount of time there. Did you find, uh, you know, comparing to like LA or some other cities in the States that Jews of color are less discriminated against in Israel? And what was that experience like? Yeah, like he said, when, when I landed in Israel for the first time, I initially, I felt like I was home. It was a weird feeling. I was like, I've never been here before. Like, what is this feeling I'm feeling? Uh, vivid dreams, all kind of stuff. Just really welcoming people. Um, I think the first time I went to Israel was maybe six, seven years ago with Artists for Israel. We, we go around the country doing, um, you know, just goodwill for people. Um, doing murals, going to hospitals, going to IDF bases, just traveling all around the country and just showing that art can unite us all. And just from that, I, every year I had to go back. I was like, I, I have to go back to this country. I love it. So welcoming. Everyone's nice. Food is amazing. Like you said, the beaches, dog friendly, kids everywhere. It's like, it's amazing. So it's definitely a different experience from in America. Uh, when I'm in America, if I see a car, like a cop car or something, I kind of feel a little, even if I'm 100% legit, I didn't do anything, I still feel a little uneasy. You're like, I gotta act right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and in Israel, I never feel that way. I never feel like, oh, I have to straighten up how I walk, the cops are walking by or anything like that. I just felt at home. So it's a very welcoming place. Uh, yeah, my fiance and my, my baby are, are there right now. They're trying to come here because the country's been closed down and open and closed, but it's a wonderful country. Um, anyone who's uh, curious, I would say go travel, see the people, taste the food, uh, go in someone's home for Shabbat. You know, that is the real Israel. You know, that's, that's the feeling that you get when you get there. Yeah. And don't forget to have a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is an interesting experience. And I think, you know, whether you're black or Jewish or any kind of, you know, underrepresented minority in this country, there's always sort of like, you don't always quite feel that sense of home. And it, it was a very strange feeling to go somewhere and finally feel maybe because it's such a melting pot, because you have Jewish roots, whatever it was to feel that for the first time is something I'll never forget. Um, and what about you, Autumn? Have you have you had a chance to visit? I didn't. I, I would love to hear hear what that experience is like. Uh, and if not, hey, that 2022. <laughs> I've not. Um, I've never gone. I've worked with artists from Israel. I've recorded and written with them, um, and I have a lot of friends from Israel. But I've never had the chance to go. Um, I would love to DJ in Israel. That would be like a really fun goal of mine. Um, oh my gosh, the nightlife. No, oh. Yeah, I know some rappers in Israel, so I can, I can, you can do your DJ scene. Now. <laughs> yeah, you heard it first here. We're getting that collaboration going 2022. Cool. You will have a blast. Well, I do want to, I want to hear about, and we'll go, go back to you, Autumn. 
again, like such a sort of unique identity and perspective to walk with. And I know that you're, you're very vocal, well, not just in the beautiful songs for a sense, but about your identity on your social media platforms. And I'd love to hear from you, like, what are kind of the, some of the things and experiences that you do love about being a Jew of color and how does that experience inform your work? I think kind of the privilege of it is you get to kind of change the world, you know, in the way of you get to break whatever people thought was normal or expected, you show them something completely different. And that's an incredible thing. You know, I've met so many people. I've met, I've met people from Israel who are like, you're black and Jewish and they were shocked. I'm like, I don't know how you don't know that because I have friends that are black and Jewish that live in Israel, but um, yeah, but just basically the whole, the whole like, you know, showing someone something different and how, how, how it's normal and it's okay and how beautiful it can be and to kind of just promote diversity. Um, sometimes, you know, the most controversial thing you can do is just being there. And that's just taking up that space, I think, is enough. And it's, it's been, I've been in a lot of rooms where there's the only person like me, and I'm sure all of you guys have as well, um, many, many powerful rooms. And it's, it's a good feeling to know that, wow, I'm probably the first, but not the last. And uh, yeah, just keep, keep basically moving on that path. In some ways, it's such a... I, I remember hearing someone describe once and it resonated so much that it's, it's a burden and a privilege, but it really is a privilege because you, when you're the only one, you're thinking like, okay, I have to, I sort of have to speak for <laughs> my community and the weight is really, really heavy, but having the power to help somebody stretch what, what their concept and belief is about what it means to be Jewish and all of like the multitudes that can exist within that is, is really, really special. And Rich, I'm curious to hear from you too. Um, what is it you, I mean, your, your work, I think is so representative of all of those identities and like, you know, this social and political scenes that go along with that. And I'd love to hear what you sort of love about being Jewish or the experiences or being a Jew of color in particular. Um, I just, I just like being me and I just like uh, representing um, my people. Um, when I, usually when I tell people, yeah, I'm Jewish, there's a little, oh, I'm shocked, or really, I don't normally see black guys with man buns that are <laughs> Jewish. But, um, but uh, yeah, um, it's, just, it's just something that I take pride in. Um, it is my, my faith, it's also my heritage. Um, early, you know, early on in life, I didn't grow up with all these uh, like rituals and all this because I was kind of, uh, separated from that but then once I got older and then I can't I actually visited Israel I kind of got a hunger for more of you know what I've been lacking in my life which is that structure uh, as far as Judaism as far as um, our high holidays all these things so uh, it's just really important for me to represent who I am my family and uh, what I represent do you have like a, a favorite holiday or tradition or even something that you kind of developed now that you, you celebrate with your family? Or well, celebrate? yeah, every time I try to, um, uh, Pesach is, is definitely one of them, but um, uh, Yom Kippur in Israel is really fun just to have all the, all the family over and just to go outside and see the kids all in the street riding their, their bikes everywhere. Do you want to inside or do you ride your bike on the aisle on and, and No, I just walk, I just just walk around and just enjoy like all the kids just having fun and it's something you would never see in America, you know, like kids on a major street riding their bikes going crazy. And uh, yeah, Yom Kippur is definitely one of my uh, my favorites. Nice. The really <laughs> fun one I think to watch involving kids in Israel is Lagba Omer. I the first time I saw it I was like these little kids are lighting fires everyone's like they never let that happen in the States. but it's sort of like tied to that like you know sense of freedom and ingenuity that you see reflected in so many facets of society there that there's this incredible amount of like freedom and happiness that that is really really special um, I mean every everyone on this panel you're also incredibly unique and have amazing stories to tell but but they're all uniquely American stories, you know, and, and, and what it means to be here at this moment. And, and what does that mean to you? And how does it inform your work? 
sorry, what's the first half of the question again? Because I was like listening to No, the no worries. Yeah, I'm still like, yeah, David gave us a lot to think about, but <laughs> like the story of being a black Jewish woman who grew up in New York with this, you know, incredible background. How does that help tell the story of what it means to be American? Oh, I mean, you know, America is is the land of of opportunity. America is supposed to be the land of, you know, immigrants, the land of anything can happen. Um, they tried to portray it a lot easier than it really is. But I think I still do believe as, as difficult as things are, I still do think America is a magical place where anything and any anyone can happen. Um, even, you know, it's crazy when I think about myself being born in the 80s and how like not too long before being born it was actually it was like illegal for you know my mom and my father to be together like the idea that it is illegal for people of different ethnicities to be married or it's just insane to me um so the fact you know that my mom was born in that era but still was smart enough and open enough to know that that was wrong and there's just more and more people like and look at us now you know um i think one out of 10 couples are um are mixed right now um in the u.s and yeah i think this america is an ever-changing society um we have a lot of growth to do and i think one thing that uh you touched on was like you know we need to forgive but people also you know need to be accountable and that just goes across the board for a lot of things that are happening right now like you know, forgiveness, I think, is a natural thing. And it's life is a lot easier when you forgive. Life is lighter. People are happier. Um, you're lighter. But at the same time, if people are not accountable for, for things that have hurt you, it's it's hard to move forward. So um, I think just in general, as, as a country, America needs to work on this. And without that, it's just really difficult to move forward. I do think we in this country have a long way to go to realize the promise of the American dream, right? Collectively and in this group. But I'm like, I, I'm looking at the participants number and looking at faces on the, the camera here. And I just keep thinking like, we are our ancestors' wildest dream. Like the amount of times that, I mean, first of all, to be, to be black and Jewish, like my grandparents who I never met would have been like, just, you know, shocked. But like for each one of us on this call to have survived like, all of the different things our communities have. Yes, we have a long way to go. We've accomplished so much, but it really does, as you said earlier, feel like the moment to really address that in, in a meaningful way and start having that dialogue and, and forgiveness. And sort of shifting things a little bit, talking about representation and responsibility. I'm fascinated. I don't know if any of you have checked out the show Bridgerton at all or heard the conversations around it. Yeah, I am like following the Twitter conversations with a Lord interest. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, it's this uh, fictional 19th century London, you know, it, it depicts a fictional 19th century London society. And one of the hallmarks of this Shonda Rhimes production is this like sprawling multiracial ensemble cast. So historical accuracy aside, uh, the showrunner said they wanted Bridgerton to reflect the world that we live in today, right? Like multiracial society. And this sparked a lot of interesting debate. So is the show erasing historical and contemporary racism and inequality? Is it just showing that people of color can live their lives and succeed without question or elaboration? Or is it just fantasy? So um, my question, I'll, I'll, I'll direct it to you first, Rich, is, is how do you go about tackling representation in a period piece in this case, but in the broader sense, how do you tackle representation in your craft as a whole? Uh, in my craft, as far as art and um, like fashion, I try to depict a lot of um, brown kids, kids of color, um, and show them in a happy light or a smiling, joyous light and not just uh, like menacing figures. Um, a lot of time in artwork, um, black people as a whole aren't, aren't shown, you know, in, in a favorable manner. Um, so I like to, uh, I have like a 10 foot painting of these two African kids and they're smiling and they're joyous. So I like to definitely represent that way. Um, I know as a whole, like, sorry, getting off the topic, but blacks and Jews go as far as back as uh, Moshe, you know, Moshe Rabinu had a, a black wife. So 
um, our alliances are strong, but we just have to reawaken those alliances and let people know that we've been allies for a long period of time. And it's just sometimes we get separated from that and we have to go back to our roots and, and who we are. But yeah, art is where I always try to put our faces and uh, I represent us. Um, I have an art exhibit in Miami right now and I have a, a painting of a messenger and uh, it's like a brown skinned messenger. You can't really see the form, you can't see the face, but you see the body and the wings and it's like um, ascending. So I always try to represent us some way. That's wonderful. And the pieces are beautiful. I haven't checked out the Miami exhibit. I hope it's online. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll send you something for sure. Awesome. Autumn, you gave a thumbs up with Bridgerton. I'm so curious, you know, you're an artist as well. Like, are, are, is, it, is it fantasy? Is it, is it erasing historical trauma? Is it, you know, just great to have that representation on screen? What are your thoughts on that? Well, okay, so the Queen, they, I was reading about that the Queen, they think, was actually mixed race in real life. Um, so that was cool to see, like, that even happened. Um, and yeah, the, the main leading character is, is black. Um, I think it's awesome. I'm super into fantasy t TV anyway, but I think it's awesome because I think it's, um, it's just change. It's just normalizing diversity, you know, and it's, it's like what, one of the biggest shows ever for Netflix and, you know, like, honestly, like, do we want to keep seeing the same people doing the same roles? Isn't it like boring? <laughs> I gotta say, I do love seeing all these beautiful brown faces wearing these like beautiful, elaborate Victoria, you know, <laughs> costumes. Like, like yes, I, I want to get used to this. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and what is that saying? Um, art replicates life, or life replicates art. I mean, you know, maybe they're they're interchangeable. Um, I think it's a good thing, and I think that it's just it's just making making this kind of diversity. Uh, become more and more normal. Like, oh yeah, of course, of course it'd be a black guy. Of course this, of course that. At the same time, I think, I think everyone knows that's not how it was back then, but just to kind of change the, what roles should be played, what roles couldn't be played. Um, yeah, let's, let's move on to a new, to a new era. It's way better TV for sure. <laughs> like let's manifest what we want to see. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, David, I don't know if you've seen the show. Feel free to touch touch on it if you want, or you can come, come back to us later. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I haven't. But what uh, one of my friends told me is that there's a really good looking black guy who <laughs> all the ladies love. And so, you know, th that's what I've heard. And, and, and ultimately, my opinion with regard to that is, you know, um, we do see more interracial couples on TV and in commercials. But we never see the one that is the most taboo, which is a black man and a white woman. That is still not accepted in this country. I'm the product of that. You don't see black men and white women in movies, on commercials. You see a lot of white men and black women. You know, I always go, because I read a lot about slavery and the history of America, you know, black women were surrogates for the white man. And so seeing a white man with a black woman you saw that during slavery, but what you don't see today and what you didn't see back then was a black man with a white woman. And so from what I understand, Bridgerton has this brother who's in great shape, who all the white women love. And, you know, maybe that's why people are talking about it, because there is a fantasy there with the black man and the white woman. And so, you know, that maybe that's sort of putting it in people's faces. Yeah, but then also removes, hopefully removes all of the sort of like taboo that previously existed around that but it remains yeah. to be but i have heard it's a phenomenal piece i, I, I want to check back it out to that. yeah yeah you got to check it out i want to go back to that a little bit because you are a student of history and um certainly educated a lot of us on, on this uh panel and in the audience but sort of looking forward taking taking that lens and then looking forward if we had excellent race relations in our community how do you think that would be reflected? Like what types of things would we see and feel, whether in the sports industry or in the broader world? Oh, well, you're asking me? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it has to be it, it, more representation of, of, of what I said. I, images, um, you know, more conversations. I think in general, our American approach and philosophies about um, 
sex is is really a problem. You know, we don't value love and sexual relationships with the opposite, you know, men and women. We don't talk about it. We don't teach it. All we men and girls learn it from is, is from movies and, and music and stuff like that. So deep down as humans, that's what drives us is, is being with the opposite sex and, you know, having love in our life. And so, you know, showing more images and also just valuing love between a man and a woman and, and also the physical act of love between men and women and accepting of that as part of nature would go a long way in, in, the, in, in helping the underlying cause really of, of what I think of racism in this country, which is the black man and being with a white woman. And you know, once that is more accepted on a widely wide scale, maybe things will change. You know, Th that's in my opinion, that's the, really the ultimate you know way yeah, to, it to is sort interesting of. Because I I think you're looking at it too from the lens of having spent a significant amount of time in Israel, and I always assumed you know I'm going to a religious country. It's going to look and feel like what my preconceived notion of of religious is. And it's so incredibly open there in a sense that I thought, oh, we're a little like hung up about like, you know, different things and yeah. like a little more conservative than I thought that I would would be. So that that was kind of a surprising thing to learn about Israel, particularly Tel Aviv, but the country yeah. as a whole. And well, honestly, I mean, in, in, you know, in Europe, I, I've lived all over Europe and it's like they're a little bit, they're definitely more open about, you know, I mean, breastfeeding in public is totally normal in France and in other countries. Whereas in America, you're looked at like you're a pervert or something. And it's like, we're humans, you know, we have human needs and we should embrace this humanity. And until we embrace humanity, then we're always going to separate people into groups and never realize that, hey, we, we, we all have a heart and a lung. And, you know, and, and I think that until Americans really embrace humanity, as a whole, mother nature, breathing, then it's going to be challenging to get over our, you know, our, our societal hangups. Mm. So there's some, there's quite a bit of work to do before we get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Autumn, what, what do you think? If we had improved race relationships, either in our community or in the broader society, what would that look like? What would it feel like? I start with this one. Okay. If we had improved race relations, I wouldn't have grown up poor. You know, um, let's start there. Like systemic racism wouldn't have existed. Um, there wouldn't have been crack in my communities. It, you know, like where it's just, it, it's, it goes so far back of like, you know, having to start life from here instead of here because you have so many hurdles to get over just to be normal with everyone else. And, you know, those are things no, no one should have to do. So I think if there was just more, if, if things were more equal on that level, um, it would be such a better society because everyone could just have a bit more relaxed way about life. And let me focus on just being the best me I can be as opposed to let me focus on survival. And, um, you know, everyone deserves, everyone deserves those opportunities and everyone's not afforded them. And I don't think that a lot of people are aware of how amazing their lives are and not having to worry about those things so you know it's just it's just it just goes so deep rooted <laughs> yeah where, where do you begin to even unpack it yeah and what about you rich thoughts on that what does it look uh, like do you like uh i think it looks beautiful uh us coming together uh forming alliances uh, i live in la so it will probably be, probably be more roles for um black people uh, in major movies and TV shows, things like that. Um, maybe um, more businesses uh, will form from these alliances. But uh, definitely, we need to come together as a whole and um, stop being so divisive, especially in America. America is really divisive. But um, yeah, if we come together, these alliances will be beautiful. Uh, will be more beautiful kids coming around in the world. It'll be beautiful relationships as far as businesses going on. and. Um, I think the world will be a better place, definitely. Absolutely. And on that note, what do you think is one of the best, we have a long way to go, I, I hope and we're working for that beautiful future that you just described, but what's the best way to educate people? I remember there's a quote by John Lewis that I love so much and he's talking about his experience with the sit-ins and like 30 years later, somebody who 
you know, physically hurt him during that period of time came and said, you know, I want to apologize. I, I, I learned and I, you know, taught my son about civil rights and social justice. And John Lewis spoke about that moment saying, we can't leave anybody behind. We have to believe in everybody and we have to work to change people's minds. Um, and he did that his entire life in public service, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, I want, I want to ask, in your opinion, what's the best way to educate people and, and bring people in and help change people's minds and behaviors? Uh, education just comes with communication. You just have to communicate with someone that doesn't look like you and talk about your experience and listen to their experiences and share your, uh, your mutual, um, I don't know how to say this, but your, what you have in common with that person. You know, Aside from just being a human, you want what? happiness, you want to be financially stable, you want uh, freedom to go about as you please, you want your kids to be happy, you want them to go to school, stuff like that. So um, I believe if we just talk and we communicate and we, we have those tough conversations, uh, we'll get past this. It's not, it's not like, you know, it's just something that's impossible. We can do this. We just have to talk and interact with people that don't look like us, you know? Because uh, just to keep going, um, I grew up in a in like Silver Lake area, of Los Angeles. So it's really a mixture. Um, there's white, Asian, Jewish, black. So I grew up with a lot of people in my school, going to a JCC, going playing basketball here, doing this and that. So um, America's a melting pot, but we just have to have these conversations and talk about what we have in common, what we don't have in common, and how we can get forward as a people. I have heard this, uh, and I don't know for folks on the call if you if you had the talk when you were growing up, and we all sort of know what the talk is, or hopefully at this point in time. But it's sort of it's the conversation that parents of black children have with their children about what their you know their relationship with the police will be as they get older, and sort of how to act in those situations. And I remember very distinctly when my mom, white Jewish lady, she had to call in her friend to give the talk because she didn't really know like. What, <laughs> Much like doing our hair growing up, you know, she had to call in some backup support. But I, I've heard of this phenomenon now um, of white parents giving a talk to their children or having the talk about their sort of responsibility in this space to speak up, act, say something, and be an ally and to disrupt. And I, I was so encouraged hearing that that I was like, that gave me so much hope uh, moving forward. And that, that's something that I haven't seen before. And I'm also, I'm going to ask you the same question, Autumn. What, what's the best way to engage and educate people? I'm a big believer the best way to educate and engage is just one-on-one. -on -one. It's you change one person or just educate them in something new and you can affect the whole world. You know, that whole, the degrees of separation between us all, they're, they're just so short and, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to be on social media. You don't have to have followers. None of that stuff matters. It's just if you have a friend and your friend might have some views that might be hurtful to someone, just just tell them why and just have an open heart and just speak from your heart and, and come, come from a place of kindness, you know? And just that one little thing, even if in your whole life, all you did was help change one person, you did something so incredible and if everyone did that, can you imagine where we would be right now? That's all you have to do. Each one, teach one. Exactly. Love it. I would say too, you know, not just friends, but hold your family accountable, right? You know, we wonder how these views get passed on from generation to generation. And when, let's say, Sardi, you know, grandpa, as an example, but is saying this, that, and the other, and nobody corrects him. There's little kids sitting all around the table listening to that who look up to him or her, whoever it is. So, so we have to speak up. And David, what are your thoughts on that? What are the best ways to like engage and educate people? Well, it has to, first of all, I, I believe that people have to want to learn. Um, so maybe that guy who, who, who attacked John Lewis later in life grew up and all of a sudden he recognized that he was wrong and he wanted to make amends. So I think you can't force feed people race relations. I just think that people are going to push back on that. I think that's the nature of man is if you try and force people to learn something or to do something or to feel a certain way, they're going to push back. Um, probably and perhaps another way would to be talk about how, you know, people's experiences between the ages of zero through 10, 12, 
have shaped their whole, you know, mindset and approach to why they think about us, you know, how they think about a person or a different race. When people can recognize that in their own self, then they can, now they can bring it to the present. So I think that, you know, before people can learn about how to do things to help other people, perhaps they, they could learn about why they even think this way in the first place. And then once they go back, and sometimes going back to your childhood is, in fact, a lot of times it's hard, it's traumatic. But when you get over that trauma, that's when you can grow. That's when you can evolve. And so I think that certainly parents who are at least mindful of that, who are sharing these lessons with their children about empathizing with other groups, that's fantastic because a 60-year-old man learning about race relations is not going to change much. But if a parent teaches his five-year-old son to treat everybody with kindness and to treat everybody equally, that's how you make change. So including mature conversations in schools is a good one, not being afraid. But the problem is, you know, when the kid comes home and wants to ask the parent about why did he feel this way, you know, then the parents are going to have to do some soul searching. And, and I think that that's really the way that this, the relationship between all humans can move forward is when the adults do some real deep soul searching, recognize that what they were told by their parents and their friends when they were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and on up, you know, until they left the house, they were being domesticated to think a certain way about a certain group of people. So I think that people have to want to reprogram themselves to be more spiritual, to be, you know, to be empathetic and to be human, you know? So I think it's kind of like people have to be ready to change and coalitions and alliances like this have to continue to get the message out there. Absolutely. And it, it is fascinating. And, you know, Rich, new dad, going to start seeing this. Um, not that I'm speaking from a place of expertise, I <laughs> happy. but, you know, when you, when you look at children and talk to children, they don't have this sort of rigid categorical thinking about, you know, race or gender identity or, you know, even ethnic origin that we sort of have, there's sort of an openness and a freedom there. And that, that's really encouraging, but we can't give up on that six year old man either. <laughs> we gotta sure, sure. Change hearts and minds. So, oh, go for it. Go for it. Um, I just want to say, cause I, I have experienced this, that I completely agree with you, David, like you're not going to change someone, but um, what you can do is plant a seed. And I've done this with several people is like, I know that I'm not going to change their mind today, but I will plant a seed and I'm going to walk away for like five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. serious. Literally like five or six years, I'm going to walk away. And I, I have cut these people off like friends that I've met. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to just be cool on you for a while until you can actually see me for who I am. And these people have come around. And they have apologized and they've done it on their own time. And they remembered very much so the conversations we had, it just needed time and they needed to see the world and figure it out. So like, I would just tell people like, don't be so discouraged if like you try and someone's just super resisting you. It's not their moment yet, but you planted the seed, walk away. That doesn't mean you need to fight and argue with them. You did what you had to do. And you probably did like something really powerful and you don't even know it. Yeah. I will, one note on that, I had that experience, you know, the experience for the people on this panel, and I think probably for a lot of folks in this hall, what, what was happening this summer, especially with George Floyd, it hit really differently, right? Because like we saw our brothers and our fathers and people in our community and just the, you know, it, it was, it was really painful. And um, I remember I had a friend call me, I had bunch of random friends call me and I was thinking like oh my gosh you need more black friends I can't be the only black person you know to like tell you about like why this is wrong or give you give you the breakdown because I'm trying you know I was like in my feelings like the couple of months and I, I had this friend who said you know I can't imagine what you're going through right now and that just struck me as like how come you can't imagine you know it, it, we're human beings just like you and you can't imagine the struggle or what that feels like to like see this over and over again every couple of months and I did what you had said. I, I had to like walk away and just say, I need you to like sit with this and, and what that feels like. And, you know, we had our first conversation about a week ago and she came back and she's done all this work. She's like total activist now, which is kind of amazing to see, but sometimes it just has to, has to sit there for a little bit before it changes. But um, yeah, every, every person, every person counts. 
So we have some great um, audience questions. So we'll, we'll go to that for before we wrap up. So the first one is for David. Um, this person asks, David, what was your experience like with the Beta Israel community, so the Ethiopian Jewish community? Did you have a chance to speak with Ethiopian Israelis about their feelings about being Black and Jewish? And if so, did you notice similarities and differences uh, in your experiences as an, a Black American Jewish person? Um, yeah, you know, when I was living in Tel Aviv, a lot of the Ethiopian and the Black Jews lived in um, Hulon, which is kind of a tougher area of Tel Aviv area. And so um, my rookie year, I had really long hair and I used to get my hair braided by an Ethiopian woman. So I would go to her house um, every, every two weeks or so to get my hair braided. And we, we would talk about, you know, we would talk about different things and her experiences. And that was, you know, that was 16, 17 years ago. So I'm not like totally clear on the conversations, but just in general, some of the conversations that I had with Israelis about Ethiopians, weren't always as nice and no. kind. Um, you know, it, Ethiopians are, they're not at the top of the food chain in Israel. You know, they're not the business leaders. They're not the wealth. They're not the real estate owners. They, they work in shops. They have lower, a lower class of lifestyle, I suppose, a lower quality of life in Israel. And, and, and they get, you know, they're not always as, as, as welcome in Israel as people might think. Um, they're there, they survive, but um, other than getting my hair braided by an Ethiopian woman and going to Hulon at times for different things, um, I didn't have too much connection with, with uh, the Ethiopians in Israel. Hmm. And Rich, <clears throat> do you, well, you've worked with a lot of like artists and, and creators there from the community. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, um, when I'm there, um, we interact back and forth. We went to, um, I think it's Guyane. I'm not sure it's the city, but it was primarily uh, Beta Israel, uh, Black Jewish kids. Um, and we painted uh, colorful murals for them in their neighborhood. And uh, we just saw how, how rich the neighborhood is, how like loving everyone is. But they're, that, like you said, they're, the, they're kind of on the low end of the totem pole. I saw a couple kids walking around with no shoes. So, um, you know, it's, it's really touching, but they're a very honest and um, upstanding people. Um, I, was, I was doing a mural for a long time and I left my sunglasses and I forgot them and I went back to where I was and I remember, oh, I left my glasses. So I go running back to where I did the mural and down the street, I see this kid that was watching me paint. He's running towards me with my glasses on. So he's like, here are your glasses. Like, I found them. So, you know, it's a... Uh, they're just a, a beautiful uh, part of society. They're beautiful people, uh, Beta Israel. Um, and uh, we just have to uplift them more and let people know that, yeah, these are legitimate Jewish people. Yeah, I will say, I, so I, I lived in Israel for two and a half years and I, yeah, I, I talked a little bit about when I went there, felt this incredible sense of home and I definitely didn't see and feel some of the harder things about being a person of color that I do here in the States. Israel, like any other country, I think, has its like social and political issues. <laughs> you know, we don't need to get into that necessarily. But I did feel like, you know, having conversations with folks like, yeah, there's a there's a ways to go in terms of like representation and equality, but that gap is so much more narrow than it is here. And I think there's a lot we could learn. Um, you know, even just in the sense of when people immigrate to Israel, there's an entire program to help you learn the language, learn the culture, learn, you know, like how the houses are set up. And I said, wouldn't that be amazing if we had something like that here? So not a perfect place by any means, but there's so much we could learn from the way, um, the way that whole system is operating, I feel. Um, so the next question is for Autumn. The, uh, this person asked, how can the Jewish entertainment industry do a better job in representing the black Jewish community? And can Hollywood in general use art to unite black Jewish Black Jewish people. Um, how can the Jewish community help the Black community? I'm just saying it. I mean, I how can how can the Jewish entertainment industry do a better job? Well, for, yeah, it's two questions. How can the Jewish entertainment industry do a better job representing the Black Jewish community? We'll touch on that one first. I think um, this alliance is like first step. You know, um, just sometimes, just you know, a lot a lot of what my friends have even done for me is like just giving me a platform 
So sometimes, you know, just creating that space of like, oh, this is an important issue we need to focus on right now. Everybody, let's focus on this, whether it's, you know, whatever the, the issue is, what's going on in the community, but just creating that space and um, having the support behind it um, for, for, for so many things, you know, that are happening in the community. Um, also, I mean, entertainment, we have the ability to create entertainment. So, <laughs> you know, whether it's through songs, through, um, I'm writing a book right now, um, a children's book, which is about diversity and who kids can become once they overcome their fears. Um, Can't wait to read it. <laughs> uh, through, through music, like a lot of the music I do with um, John Batiste, you know, it's mm -hmm. about, uh, a lot of it's about the Black experience. So um, just, just supporting it, you know, just, you know, just supporting things and creating space for, for voices that need to be heard, I think is a, is a big way. So make that space. And then once you're at the table, got to use your voice, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Rich's daughter will be getting your book for Hanukkah, her first Hanukkah. <laughs> Rich, you're going to get the free copy. <laughs> yes. um, so the next question, um, there are a lot of Black Jewish entertainers from Rashida Jones to Maya Rudolph to Tracy Ellis Ross, but they often don't talk a lot about their Judaism, so people don't know about this community. Why do you think that is? They could be good role models for all of us. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you first, David. Well, when I was, uh, I was born David Bluthenthal, and that was my last name until I changed it in 2008. And for me, um, it was hard being Jewish because black kids made fun of me. Um, I couldn't hide, you know, I couldn't hide because my last name was Bluthenthal. Um, so it's, it's, um, I, I understand why sometimes people don't want to come out and say they're Jewish because you know, Jews are not always welcome in, in different circles. Um, and they haven't been for thousands of years. Um, I know some of my friends would make, white friends too, would make fun of me if I didn't want to, you know, go out and spend money at Sizzler. I wanted to get some tacos at Taco Bell because they were less expensive. They'd say, quit being so Jewish, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So they'd make fun of me in these, in these regards. Um, and again, I think boys, especially athletes can be hard on each other verbally because they're pushing each other and challenging each other. But it made me in some ways ashamed to be Jewish. Like I didn't, I didn't want people to know I was Jewish, but I couldn't really hide because of my last name. When I was in college on the basketball team, I walked past the Hillel every day and never stopped inside. I didn't even know it was a Hillel because I didn't, I didn't want to be Jewish because I got made fun of for being Jewish. So I understand why people don't always want to come out and be like, hey, I'm Jewish. You know, I'm Jewish because Jews aren't always accepted, you know, and I think that Jews of color, you know, it's it, um, you didn't ask me that question about the, what I love about it. But what I love about being black and Jewish is that I can talk about this and I can put it in people's face. Uh, and sometimes you got to put it in people's face for them to go, oh, so you're uncomfortable feeling Jewish. Yeah, that's how I was feeling, you know? Otherwise, people think that everything is okay and everything should just continue on the way it is. But there are people out there that are afraid to be who they are because of what others will say. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, my answer to why someone would not want to come out and be openly Jewish because, you know, it can be challenging. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that and, and also for sharing what you love about your, your amazing, beautiful, <laughs> identity um you know i i don't i i doubt this is the case for the the celebrities that were listed but one of the reasons you know i'm very proud to be jewish and when i before i was working in a, a jewish organization i was volunteering a lot and doing a lot of different things but like when i tell people i'm jewish and then there's always the question of well like tell me about your your parents and your whole like family tree and everything like that because i don't have a jewish last name and it, it forces me to tell a story that's kind of painful that I'm still grappling with about my, you know, somewhat similar to Autumn's, like the way I grew up because I was black and Jewish or the fact that I, I don't know most of the people in my family because you're isolated from both groups. And it's not really something that you want to talk about when you just met someone like three minutes ago, you know, yeah. so I think it's probably a different case for the celebrities, but I do feel like when I say that and I'm in a new space, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to like, go, go deep and, and get a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what about, you know, Autumn and Rich, uh, any thoughts on that question? 
why people don't share their Jewish identity outright, especially in the entertainment industry? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that, um, that think Jews killed Christ. So, you know, and America is a primarily a Christian country. So you don't want people to be looking at you like oh, you killed their God, you know, like you don't want people to be uh, just uh, looking at you, you know, sideways. It's already hard in America with brown skin. So then you, you throw on, you know, Jewish on top of it. So it's like, maybe they don't want to just put it out there like that. And if it comes up in conversation, then yeah, we can talk about it, but it's not something you just throw in people's face, you know. You do kind of get that sense of feeling like a canary in a coal mine in some ways. Like, am I going to be, you know, have to test the safety of this <laughs> environment? <laughs> and what are, your, what are your thoughts on that, Autumn? You know, because, and I hope maybe this panel will encourage others to be more open about their identity, but, you know, these individuals could be role models for people who were kids like us growing up. Like, where the heck do I fit in? But what, what are your thoughts on that, Autumn? Why don't people share? I'm not sure because I don't, you know, white Jewish men are not hiding it um, at all, you know? So why is that? They're not, you know, most of them in, in powerful positions are not changing their names and are very proud of, of who they are. So I'm not, I'm not totally sure why that is. Um, I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. And I can't speak for them. Maybe, you know, Maybe they don't want to deal with the, some negativity about being a woman and this and that and Jewish. You know, maybe they've had some bad experiences. Maybe I, I don't. I don't actually know. But the fact that some people can can do it proudly and then other people feel like they can't, I think that that needs to be addressed and unpacked. Um, yeah, I'd like to get to the root of that. Yeah. Next panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think just Jewishness in America is perceived as white or white passing. But, you know, when you when you go to like Israel and you see, you know, the like you said, the brown skinned Jews and Jews that look like us, you realize that in America it's painted in a different light. So a lot of people, you know, they don't embrace their Jewishness because in America it's it's something that doesn't look like them, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even in the States, I mean it it struck me and this isn't exactly like a totally contemporary example, but even, you know, someone like Jon Stewart or Natalie Portman still feeling the sense that they need to change their name in the entertainment industry. Like, can you not make it as far if everybody knows that you're Jewish in that space? And I always kind of wondered about that. But again, we still have, we still have work that we need to do. <laughs> so the next question is, uh, the Black and Jewish community have a shared legacy of persecution. They also have a shared legacy of collaboration from co-founding the NAACP here in DC to working together during the civil rights era. How do we remind people of these common bonds? David, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that we are, we are what we eat. And so I think that, you know, food, food for me, food is a very important topic and, and, and healthy food. And so, you know, with regard to the collaboration, you know, going forward, you know, some things that, in my opinion, what can be done is, first of all, for the black man to, to, to remember who he is, you know, in life and remember what, what he has done. You know, slavery traumatized black people to not want to get out on the farm anymore. So now there's no black farmers because they don't want to get out on the farm when the black skin and the red skin is meant to go on the farm. We can go out in the sun and be in the sun all day and farm and, and, and grow food. And so, you know, in my opinion, one way to, to help in, in Hollywood, you know, and, and, and sort of media to help this is to, to portray that, you know, to, to, to remove this or to at least talk about the trauma, you know, continue to talk about the trauma of slavery, but then, but then try and, re, you know, change that, change what it means for a black person to be out working in a field on a farm. It's no longer slavery. Now there's black people that choose to be out there uh, growing food for their black communities. The and these farms are owned by, and so Hollywood, the white Jewish people can help facilitate that financially, business know-how, in the media, with images. So showing images of black people doing things other than rapping and selling drugs and things like that. You got to show productive, positive images of black men, especially men, because we see black women doing all these great things. 
the whole Biden administration, everybody in the government is going, we got to help the black woman, we got to help the black woman, but we also got to help the black man. If we don't raise up the black man, empower him, then the black community cannot really thrive and evolve. And so one way is to portray black men in positive lights so that when young black boys see these positive black men, they can aspire to that rather than only aspiring to be professional athletes or rappers or movies. We got to change the image. And it really starts with the black man wanting to change the image. And then from there, it's all about the Jewish and the Hollywood offering that support to help the black man create the image that he wants to portray to his black son. Yeah. Hey that, David. Preaching, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say too, black men raise up black women in the home, in public life, everywhere. But it really does, like what you were saying, representation really matters. To touch on this question a little bit, reminding people of the common bonds, I think that's incredibly important, but it's also the work that we're doing today, right? Like, Definitely. I love hearing the stories about the coalition building we did during the civil rights era. That, that means something, that changed people's lives. Um, but stuff like this, you know, what was happening in Georgia a few weeks ago, like, those are the stories that I think are really, really important to tell too. What's happening on the ground and how can we continue that coalition? What are your thoughts on that, Autumn? How can we kind of remind people of our shared struggle and coalition building, either historically or contemporarily? I think that we're in a really lucky place right now because I think we're part of making history. And um, it's hard to see that while you're in the moment and in, in real time. But um, I think we are, we are in this beautiful moment. You know, so, like I love that the Alliance um, the Black Jewish Alliance basically like, you know, say someone says something uh, incredibly racist against Black people or Jewish people or whatever, um, you know, instead of just necessarily canceling this person, how about we just talk to this person and have a conversation like, hey, this is why this is wrong. This is why this is, who this hurts. And just going back and then educating them and giving them history, you know, especially in the era of cancel culture right now, where it's just so like, oh, you're done, you're done, you're done, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> all these people are just gonna become angrier and yeah. bitter. More bitter. They're yeah. gonna conspire and- And scared, that. you know? <laughs> yeah, we need to like stop that and um, give, people, give people an opportunity to grow and, and have space in our heart and room in our, in our hearts for people to change. People can change. You know, some people are like, oh, no, people can't change. No, they absolutely can change. If that was true, we would just be born and then nothing would happen. We would just be babies like forever. So, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but like, you know, let's just give space for that. And um, we, we are controlling the future, right? Anything we want to happen can happen. So if we want a better tomorrow, we got to be better people. And, yeah. and just that's move forward with that and correct people and be accountable so um, I, just, I think we're in a really, really special place right now. And um, it's definitely a privilege to be alive in this moment. We are ancestors' wildest dreams. <laughs> it's amazing. Definitely. And Rich, what are your thoughts on that? Um, repeat the question, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it's, how do we remind people of the common bonds between, you know, it's funny to say like the black and the Jewish communities are black and Jewish, <laughs> either <laughs> and, or. and or. Yeah, we just have to, um, talk about our alliances, talk about how far we go back in history together, um, talk about uh, Martin Luther King marching with rabbis, um, just show that we have a, a shared common interest to uh, progress our people as a whole, you know, because uh, we definitely have a, a shared history. We both, uh, both communities were part of slavery. So we definitely need to um, come together, talk about it, see our shared experiences and, and go forward and see what we can do together uh, just to make both communities feel more welcome on both sides, you know, because there is some uh, violence against Jews in New York as far as uh, the Hasidic community. And uh, most of this time is happening with, like with young black kids that don't really know what they're doing. They're just, you know, just causing ruckus or causing trouble for no reason. So if you let them know that <clears throat> these people share our history. They have, they were slaves just like we were slaves. Then I think they'll be more empathetic. It will be more, um, more bridge building. It will be more people coming together. 
And uh, yeah, I think we can go from there. And there's uh, one of the last ones is, what do you most want the Jewish community to know about the black community and vice versa? I would want the Jewish community to know that, um, you know, black people aren't uh, dangerous. We're not trying to hurt anyone. Uh, we come in love, we come in peace. We're very compassionate and forgiving people. Um, and uh, vice versa for the black community to know that uh, us Jews are not Christ killers. <laughs> we're, we're not evil. We don't have a, a spaceship with laser beams uh, <laughs> shooting. <laughs> So, you know, we just got to dead all those crazy conspiracies that people talk and, you know, and let them know that, you know, we're all people and we're all God's children. And uh, if we come together like that, I think we'll be good. Yeah. Spoiler alert. We do not have space lasers. I, <laughs> again, I feel very cheated. <laughs> I know. I wanted a space yeah. laser. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Autumn, Autumn, what are your thoughts on that? What would you want the Jewish community to know about the Black community or vice versa? Jewish community to know that the black community are, you know, want a good life for their children. They've had a really hard time um, struggling. Uh, things are not fair. Um, you can't always see what's going on, but it's, but just make space and, and have room to understand that things are, however you see them, it's probably harder than they look. And as far as the black community to the, the Jewish community, the black community, I want to say the same thing, that uh, things are not as they seem, you know, we're hurting, um, struggling, Jewish people don't feel safe. Um, I have so many friends that feel scared and threatened and, you know, it's, it's in a different way than the black community. Um, it's not necessarily by police officers. And I just want to also say like the majority of the, the problems that both communities are, are facing are not from each other, it's from white supremacists. So like, you know, a, as a whole, I don't want this to come across like um, it's black and Jewish people necessarily having so, so much beef because that's, a, that's just a very small thing. You know, the, the grand scheme is there's white supremacists out here who hate black people, who hate Jewish people, who are walking around saying, Six million wasn't enough who are, you know, Confederate flags. And these are the people that we all need to unite together and and condemn. Wow. And it's not okay. And we're stronger together than alone. And we have we just have to do better because we need to live in a society that's safe for everyone. And right now I don't feel like it is. So whatever you can do, where wherever you are watching this, <laughs> whatever you can do to help make this a better planet for all of us like please do it because right now it's just it just kind of sucks david what what are your thoughts on that well i guess for the um for the black community i i would want them to know that jews for thousands of years have been persecuted they've been pushed out of different countries they've been you know butchered and killed and every time they've had to go to a new country they have had to work hard together. They've had to support each other. They've had to raise each other's children and teach each other. Um, so when, when people say Jews like to do business with each, with each other, that's because they were forced to thousands of years ago. They found Israel. Israel became their home. I talk about how every human being needs a home, you know, to go back to. Israel has become the Jewish home. We should, we should support that because every human needs a home to go to. So for the blacks, I would say, look, the Jews have had a tough time as well. Um, they're not, you know, they're not evil people. They're just trying to survive like everyone else and doing it in a group is great. For the Jews, what I would want them to know about blacks is black people are closer to the primitive. The primitive is love, it's joy, it's happiness, it's life and it's nature. And this is what, em this is what the black person embodies. But because of the history, there's bitterness has been grown. Bitterness has grown in the hearts of black people. When in reality, that's not who we are. We're positive, happy, loving people. You can see it in the music. You can see it in the way we move our body. We're, we're, not, we're not animals, we're not beasts. We are loving people. And so like any loving human, we need to be loved. We need love back and we were not loved. And we ourselves, the black community, have not gotten over that trauma. But one thing is the Jews can at least acknowledge 
that there was trauma. They can acknowledge that the black man is today living with the trauma of slavery and that the only way to sort of get over that is with positive images of the black man. And, and, and so I would, I, would, I would hope that, you know, what I would tell Jewish people is kindness, you know, have kindness, treat these black people as equals. You know, don't, look, don't, don't, don't be scared of them because they're by nature loving people. Yeah. Treat everyone as, treat us as equals. Yeah. Acknowledge the love and the joy and, and also the hardship. And my last question, I know we're getting so close on time, so we'll have to be really quick, but I, I want to ask, what is one piece of media that's giving everyone hope during the pandemic? And I'll start by saying I just saw Judas and the Black Messiah the same weekend I finished Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' Lessons in Leadership, but I was so struck by, you know, a 21-year-old with such uh, vision and a drive to, you know, change a community. And then Jonathan Sachs, you know, call for leadership to act, to speak up when you see see something wrong that's happening. And I'm curious to hear from you all. David, what's giving you hope during the pandemic? You know, I guess as far as race relations goes, it's probably just the amount of commercials I see with uh, interracial couples. Um, as I said before, still haven't seen many black men with white women. But other than that, we've seen lots of different combinations of people. And I think that, you know, more and more, our society is becoming a comp, you know, people who are combined with multiple races. And I think that by seeing these images on during the Super Bowl and during all these different um, TVs, these commercials and these television shows with, you know, interracial couples is probably, it's helping. I believe it's helping. It's sad that we still get excited about that, but it is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Thought, uh, really quickly, what about you? I have to agree with you, um, David. Like during the pandemic, I, I think we all watch more TV than ever. And um, that was the first time I, I noticed it a lot. Like almost every commercial yeah. was a biracial couple. And I remember like telling someone like, yo, are you watching TV? Like every commercial, bro, <laughs> it's like a viral. Like I'm, this is crazy, you know, especially growing up where like I never saw girls that look like me. You know, the first mixed person I ever saw was Mariah Carey. So like, I was just like, this is, this is crazy. No, but it's, it's super dope. And it's just, um, it's just normalizing it. You know, I love it. Yeah. And what about you, Rich? Uh, yeah, I think movies, TV, uh, media like that, art uh, is definitely uh, the best way to show us and shine us in a good light. Um, there's tons of um, very good black artists out there. I would say support black art, um, you know, black directors and, uh, Black actors, yeah. This, uh, the Judas and the Black Messiah was a really good movie. It's really sad that that happened in my hometown. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we need more leaders like that. But I think, uh, as a whole, like in the Black community, they're afraid to have leaders out, outspoken like that because they believe they might be assassinated and stuff like that. But yes, we need to shine us in a very good light in media, TV, movies, and art. Right. Well, I want to thank you all so much and thank the Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance for hosting this discussion. There's an enormous uh, cultural responsibility that comes with the position our panelists are in. It's not easy to speak out, but we're in a unique moment, and this is a really important opportunity for Black and Jewish members of the entertainment community to use their platforms to build on the long history of collaboration and impact society for the greater good. So we're incredibly grateful to all of you for your time and insights today. Um, and for folks in the audience, you can learn more about the Alliance and all the upcoming events, including a great discussion with Gene Simmons, Sharon Osborne, Stanley Clark, and Randy Jackson next Tuesday at blackjewishentalliance.com. And also I would, you know, definitely Google our panelists, look them up. They're doing amazing things. Their work is incredible. And we learned so much from you today. So thank you again for your time. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And David, I want to play some ball with you if you still hoop, man. <laughs> I'm down. Okay. Actually, I'll just play some horse. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> I got to save my knees, man. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm all about self-preservation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. All right. Blessing. Thank and, you for uh, joining everybody. us, everyone.